You must remember that the princess lived within the British royal family for 15 years. She knew exactly what went on within it. She knew how things were done. She was at times extraordinarily unhappy and her husband did nothing. She felt very wretched much of the time, but at the same time she was a mother and she had to maintain a brave face for her children. She didn't want them too affected by her evident distress at finding herself in a loveless marriage with a husband who was carrying on an affair and not even bothering to hide it from him. Often the most disturbing feature of mental illness is just how little it takes for people who seemed otherwise fine to move off their normal behavior before they're labeled crazy or unstable even to try to understand just how trapped they feel. When in the depths of depression can help enormously. She's, can't you see me looking from side to side? Can you see me doing that? Do you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for her. And she was there. She was even at my wedding. So this spectre was always there in the princess's life. She found her soulmate. Her soulmate was Hasnut Khan, the heart surgeon, not Dodi Al Fayed. Hasnut Khan had been the princess's companion for over two years. Nobody knew about Hasnut Khan. That was not played out on the world stage. Whereas, after they'd broken up, the princess was invited to the south of France by the Mohammed Al Fayeds. She met Dodi Al Fayed. Did you know that the romance of the princess and Dodi Al Fayed was 30 days from beginning to end? It only lasted 30 days. That was not the love of her life. That was not the man she was going to marry. That's all fabrication. I spoke to her regularly when she was away. Have you seen Hasnet? I said, yes, I went for a drink with him last night. What does he think of my, me being here in the south of France with Dodi Al Fayed? Well, he's not too pleased. Has he seen the pictures in the papers? Yes, he has, because you know his routine. You know every morning he goes to the corner shop and sees the press. You know that. And I know that's what you're doing. You're manipulating the world's media by having these pictures taken to show Hasnet who you're with. It's a sort of a... Are you jealous? I said to the princess, when are you coming home? I'm coming home on Sunday, Paul. I'm just bored. I'm on this boat. It's freezing cold downstairs. It's boiling hot on deck. I'm sending these pictures out and nobody's coming back to me. I'm having no communication. I need to come home. But the only way home is on the Harrods jet. The only way I can get home is via Paris because Dodie has to go to Paris to do some business for his father. How is he with you? Oh, he's very spoiling. He's very generous, the princess said. He's given me a necklace, some earrings. He's given me a watch. I said, you know what's coming next, don't you? He's going to give you a ring. Do you think so? Oh, yes. He'll give you a ring. But remember, when he gives it to you, put it on the fourth finger of your right hand. Oh, yes. 
fourth finger, right hand. I can hear her saying it, fourth finger, right hand. Yes, that's the thing to do. I'll do that. You always know what to do. That's exactly what I'll do. So if there was a ring, which I very much doubt, it would have been placed on the fourth finger of the right hand. Look at the footage of the princess on that fatal night. Look at her going down in the elevator. Is that a woman in love? I don't think so. I knew the princess inside and out. That is not a woman with the man she's about to become engaged to or the man she wants to marry. That's a woman going out into the Paris night and she doesn't want to. Fate in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong man. That tragic accident should never have happened, but that's what it must be. It must be an accident. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car accident in Paris. Her companion, the Haradzai Dodi Al Fayed, has been killed. The driver of the princess's car is also understood to be dead. The accident happened at just after midnight in the west of the city near the Alma Bridge. So early Sunday morning, I arrived in Paris and was taken straight by the British ambassador, taken to the hospital. And I remember going into the elevator and the elevator doors opening on the first floor and looking down the corridor and seeing two gendarmes stood outside of a door. And I thought, that's where she is. So I was led not to that room, but to the room next door, where I waited for a while with an Angl Anglican priest and a, and a Roman Catholic priest. Nurse Humbert was the French nurse on duty. Small, petite nurse that could only speak broken English. And she came to me and said, Paul, would you like to go in to see the princess? I said, yes, I would. I stared for a while in disbelief. And I watched the fan whirring on the side of the bed table. And as it moved, it moved the princess's hair. And I could see her eyelashes moving. And I took her hand and said, Wake up. You're asleep, aren't you? Wake up. Can it, is there any possibility of any announcement of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me uh, if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Wait. Wait, Prince Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> he said we wouldn't have to wait too long. Uh, Was he completely off <laughs> Was he? Oh, sorry, I, sorry. Was he completely off beam when he said we wouldn't have to wait too long? February 1981, the waiting was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. The ring was a sapphire surrounded by diamonds. The couple looked happy and relaxed, delighted, like everyone else, that a wedding would take place. She was much too young for him. He was a young person himself, and she was even younger. Can you take us back to when you first met? If you um, can remember. Can you remember yes, when you first met? Yes, yes, certainly can. It was 1977. Miss Charles came to stay as a friend of my sister Sarah's uh, for a shoot. We sort of met in a ploughed field. <laughs> and slightly what, previous to that. <laughs> and what did, you th what did you think then? What was your instant impression, both of you? 
what well, do you think I, about Lady Diana? Well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And I mean, great fun mm. and bouncy and full of life and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Did it cross either of your minds that um, the three years' time you would be announcing your engagement, thinking of getting Not married? No. no. I think when you live in the royal family, you're not, well, you're not exposed to the real world. So you grow up much slower and they, you know, sometimes you think that they have the most childlike sense of humor and they laugh about very childlike things, but they do because they haven't been out there like all of us. So Charles has been very protected. He's also courted her older sister, of course, um, Sarah had been a suitor and on Diana's wedding day her sister Sarah turned to her and said I thought all this was going to be mine one day and now it's yours there was sibling rivalry in the Spencer household Diana wasn't meant to achieve the fact that Diana became Princess of Wales probably future Queen of England was beyond the Spencer family to comprehend. It wasn't for her to achieve. The brother should have achieved. It's his estate, not Diana's. So there was always some jealousy coming from the Spencers. Prince Charles wasn't always kind to the princess. In fact, sometimes he was quite cruel. I remember one occasion she came downstairs wearing a beautiful black and white Catherine Walker gown. And she said, Charles, I've had it made specially. Do you like it? You look like you belong to the mafia, he said, which cut her down to her knees. And then on one occasion she came down in a tartan dress and said, do you like this one? but you look like a British Caledonian stewardess. It was always undermining, just before an engagement began, so that she would lose her confidence. So it was mental cruelty in a way. I never saw any physical violence. I saw tables being upset. I saw crockery being thrown across a room, but I never saw any physical violence. I think the breaking point was probably in about 87 when Charles went up to Scotland for practically the whole summer and Diana stayed down here. And I think that she just, I, I mean, they just realized that they were completely unsuited. And she was, you know, Charles was very, very miserable. Very miserable because he, he, he knew that as a, as a future monarch, he really couldn't mark up on his marriage. And, um, uh, the thought uh, of what he had done deeply depressed him. So he wasn't a lot of fun to be around. And Diana was, was thinking, you know, I've got to get out of this, but she hadn't really thought it through. So if there was ever a moment, I think it was about, you know, in, in the autumn of 87, that, that, and that's when the press realized that things were really bad. You know, there was a, there was a lot of signs beforehand, but that was when it started to to actually c come out in the press. Do you find it a very daunting experience that uh, yesterday you were a nanny looking after children, um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales, and and one day you would, all I know, likely would be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden the transition. It is, but I've had a small run up to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. Now, if you watch that, that piece of footage when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? Princess Diana's beaming. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Well, it obviously, means, your own interpretation. obviously means two very happy people. Yes, well, congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. 
Charles didn't really know what love was. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. When I joined Buckingham Palace way back in 1976, it was already rumoured that Prince of Wales would be marrying somebody like Princess Mary Astrid or Amanda Natchball. There were rumours that he would be marrying somebody else. Lady Diana Spencer was never there. There were always suitors around Prince Charles. He was the most eligible bachelor in the world at that time, heir to the throne of England. So he was never short of female companions. I saw him occasionally with the Queen. He'd stay at Buckingham Palace. His suite of rooms were at the palace. He had his own valet. He had his own household. And he was very independent. And really, he was searching for someone who could provide him with an heir and a spare. That was his main priority. He was getting old. And the Queen had said to him, isn't it about time you settled down, Charles? Isn't it about time you made us grandparents? So his time was right when Lady Diana Spencer came into his vision. I remember the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer very well because I was at Buckingham Palace. I was responsible for the top table, which was the bride's table, the bride and groom, and of course the queen and Prince Philip, and the bridesmaids. So I was waiting for the bride to come back. She'd appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. And then, at the end of a very long red carpeted corridor, I noticed this ball of white racing towards me and I realized it was Princess Diana. She'd rolled her train up into a ball, tucked it under her arm. She had her slippers in one hand and she was racing down this corridor lined with windows and the diamonds of the Spencer family tiara were glinting in the sunshine and she was racing towards me. Just me and her in one corridor she was like a galleon in full sail. What a picture of hope and happiness and love. She had it all. And that day, I waited the wedding breakfast in the ball supper room, served the queen and the bride, and the bride refused everything. She didn't eat a morsel. And she said to me later, I couldn't eat a thing, Paul. My stomach was in knots. I was just totally wound up by the day, by the excitement, by the spectacle. She says, but you know, the most wonderful thing was walking down the aisle of St. Paul's Cathedral with my father. She says, but did you ever look at the footage of that? I said, I've seen it many times. She says, next time you look at it, watch me. She says, can't you see me looking from side? Decide. Can you see me doing that? Do you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for her. I'm looking for Camilla. And she was there. She was even at my wedding. So this specter of Camilla was always there in the princess's life. Well, Diana Spencer, as she was, is probably one of the most insecure people I'd ever met. Um, and I think from her insecurities. And she was also a real mixture of being completely naive and yet worldly wise. So she was a, a 
barrel load of contradictions. I mean, Diana could be several people in one day. And I think one of the reasons that people are so fascinated with her still is that she was a different person with different people. And I, I take that to be part of her insecurity because she wanted to please the person she was talking to. She wanted to tell them what they wanted to hear. And so um, she was always different, so she was always fascinating. very old-fashioned, uh, very respectful, charming man. He likes women. He is definitely not a woman hater. And he is also a people pleaser. But he has got a very short temper. If, you know, if he loses his temper, he's then incredibly sorry and full of apologies. So he's, he's basically a very kind, and thoughtful and very sensitive person, but because of who he is and the life that he's led, he is used to getting his own way and he's used to getting his own way quickly. In the early days, Diana's light was small, but he began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And it was a sort of a star is born situation. Prince Charles would say to her, while I married you, I made you a princess. You weren't born royal. I'm the royal. So it would peeve him when on royal visits, people would be shouting on one side of the street, we want Diana, we want Diana. And I think in some interviews, he actually did say, I wish I could split my wife in half to do both sides of the street because they don't actually want me. This is a man who's been born to be king. This is a man who's been treated from the very beginning as a god, suddenly being eclipsed by this woman who wasn't very happy. Well, Charles was so used to having all the attention on him, which it had been since he was born, um, he, he didn't like the idea that they walked down a street, say, when they were doing a, a, a royal engagement and the crowd were calling, Diana, Diana. So he felt surplus and didn't really know what to do with himself and made lots of sort of rather pathetic remarks like, there should be two of me and if I cut myself in half. I mean, he didn't know what to do or say. And, and yes, he, 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 it was a form of, of, of jealousy, yes, it was. The rest of the royal family and the royal household, they treated Diana as if she was just another girl. In fact, they didn't give her much consideration at all. I did notice that one day, going through the drawing room, the old queen mother, she passed the magazine table and Diana's face was on the front of Hello Magazine or something. And as she walked past the table, she flipped the magazine over onto its backside and carried on walking. That to me said, she's not really accepted. They don't like it. She's beginning to outshine even the senior members of the royal family. This is dangerous territory. Well, I think after they got married and they went on their honeymoon, I, I think even then things were starting to unravel a bit because I don't think it, it, it matched what Diana had expected. She had this vision of uh, being like a fairy princess and being carried away into the sunset. But the minute she was married, her husband was off working. I mean, it was, 
you know, he, he's always been a very hard worker and he was devoted to his duty. And on, on the honeymoon, she was so in love, but he spent a lot of time reading books, which she didn't really quite understand. I think on, on the honeymoon, it was when her book Bulimia, which she was already having a problem with, uh, really took hold. Um, and she just, you know, she was on this e enormous yacht, Britannia, surrounded by like 200 crew, and yet she was on her own and she didn't know how to deal with it. She was too young and too naive. And, and Charles was on the upper deck reading and sunbathing and she was lonely. Well, I used to say that Diana was a high school dropout and Charles was a university lecturer. I mean, Diana, they were so different and obviously that can work very well, but she was very, very young and she'd had no experience of life. And although she'd lived on the Sandringham estate and knew the royal family, she didn't really know the royal family. And unless she didn't really know what it would be like to be married into them, although her, her father, uh, Lord Spencer had been an equerry to King George VI and was an equerry to the Queen, but uh, and he knew how the royal court worked, but Diana didn't. I think she thought it was all going to be sort of wonderful. Um, so she'd been disappointed from the very beginning, and she just she had this vision of Charles, which wasn't really him at all. I mean, and then she started to find Charles very dull. And he found her stupid. I mean, she had a very quick wit, but she wasn't well read. She wasn't really educated. And Charles was highly educated. And all his friends were much, much older. So he started to dump his friends. Um, and Diana's friends were all much, much younger. And so they started to lead separate lives very, very early on. And then Diana had uh, children very, very quickly. I mean, William was born in 82 and she'd only got married in 81, um, and she had a very difficult pregnancy with William. So she was, you know, she was getting used to being royal, she was, she was pregnant, she, the, the marriage wasn't quite what she imagined it, but she thought it would all be all right. So she was living on a dream, really. In the summer of 92, a recording of Diana speaking to one of her friends, who actually was her lover, James Gilby, appeared in one of the newspapers. The transcript of this recording was unbelievable. Frankie said to me today, she said, I sat next to Nigel Haverdale, then all we could talk about was you. And I said, Frankie, how awful for you? She said, oh, don't worry, the emotion club. A lot of people talk to her about me, which she can't help. No. Her at all. I know you don't have any desperate tag on to your coattails. Well, she can't. No, she absolutely can't. I need to make that quite clear. If you want to be like me, you've got to suffer. It was difficult for me to tread the path between. Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Now Diana arrived every weekend with the boys on Friday afternoon and left every Sunday. But someone else occupied that space in between. And I learned to serve two royal mistresses. One, Princess of Wales, and the other, Mrs. Parker Bowles. This was still a secret. I was keeping this secret for both the prince and the princess until, of course, it became intolerable. It was a conversation uh, 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 Charles and Camilla had previously, and it obviously was done by a radio hacker, but it was very intimate, and it was absolutely horrific, actually. And, uh, <laughs> and I think people thought that Charles is never, can never be king. This is, you know, he, he talks uh, about how, uh, you know, what he would like to be doing to Camilla in a very intimate way, and it's just, it was horrible. Including The Express, The Star and The Sun, said they wouldn't publish the full text. Uh, the press in general is at the centre of a major debate over privacy, with the Calcutt report uh, looming and the controversy over that even today. So we have taken the decision today not to publish the full transcript of the Camilla Gate tapes. 
But with thousands of copies of the magazine now being faxed around Britain, some editors are uneasy. Those in the know in London and the chattering classes and those with fax machines to Australia can know what's in it, but the rest of the country doesn't. And that reminds me of the 1930s, when a few editors and posh people in the know knew about the abdication crisis, plain folk didn't. Buckingham Palace tonight declined to comment on the contents of the magazine. There's been no comment from Mrs Parker Bowles. In the past, her husband has dismissed such allegations as rubbish. Well, I think what happened with the Queen was that she sat on the fence, hoping it was all going to get better, which I think is probably what you would do. That's the normal reaction of a mother. You don't want to interfere. But of course, and then Prince Philip was, was saying, little bit, little bit, you've got to do something. And so he was egging her on and she was pulling back because you don't want to interfere in, in other people's lives. But eventually, Diana used to come to the Queen. She'd go and see her, the Queen's page of the presents and say, I've got to see Her Majesty. And, and the page would say, well, I'm, I'm really sorry, um, Your Royal Highness, but she's busy. She's with the Prime Minister or she's with whoever she was with. And Diana would wait until whoever it was left. And then she'd run in, <laughs> which was absolutely unprecedented. And there was the Queen. She'd just been having a meeting with some government minister or some, someone really senior in, a, in another world, not in the royal world. And she was probably thinking about it. And then Diana pops through the door crying and saying, Mom, Mom, everybody hates me. You've got to help me. I, you know, I, you know, hysterical. And nothing in the Queen's life had ever prepared her for, for that, that kind of confrontation. Imagine if you were brought up in this very, very strict world when everybody is also very respectful. And there's very little emotion going on. And so the Queen had never, ever had to deal with this. And the royal family really don't have to deal with anything they don't want to deal with emotionally because they've got people around them to say, sorry, can't put you through. Sorry, they're busy. You know, you're protected. Um, so the Queen used to find this really difficult. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes until it became irretrievably broken down. Us both having tried. The rift in their marriage had already been exposed with the publication of a book that went straight to the top of the bestseller list this summer. Diana, her true story, claimed to tell from the inside the tale of a loveless marriage, with evidence from some of her closest friends, friends like her former flatmate, Caroline Bartholomew. Its author was Andrew Morton. Well, the Andrew Morton book was a sensation. No one had any idea that Diana was involved with the book at all. And in fact, she even denied that she was at the beginning. But what happened was she decided, she made a decision that she wanted the world, if you like, to know the truth of her marriage. She was just felt it was going to be really cathartic. I, I don't know if she ever regretted it. I think she probably did because it caused so much trouble. But so she decided that Andrew Morton was a nice uh, sort of intermediary to, to put these words out. And he was a friend of her friend, Dr. James Colehurst. They played squash together. So she thought, oh, this is, I will tell James. Um, uh, and then James can take the tapes to Morton. And that way we'll, we'll never meet. Um, and of course, uh, she, you know, this was planned sometime before the book came out. So the book came out in the summer of 92, but this all took place really uh, at, at the end of 91, the beginning of 92. So, um, and when it was serialized in the Sunday Times before the book came out, I think it was, uh, I know that Prince Charles had the uh, newspaper faxed to him, this is the days of faxes, the night, you know, as soon as it dropped at midnight, the fax was sent through to Highgrove. And I think Diana says that the next morning, I think, at, at breakfast, I mean, he acted like nothing had happened at all. So it was that bad. It was just a freezing atmosphere. We saw Andrew Morton in that report, the author of that book. He's with me now in the studio. Your sources are pretty close to the princess. What have you learned about the timing of this announcement? 
Well, since September, negotiations have been taking place between the Prince and Princess about living arrangements, about working arrangements, and the, the timing, of course, has been knocked off balance by the Windsor Castle fire and by the fact that Princess Anne is, is remarrying. But it, it's been really a question of the last few, few weeks uh, that people have known that uh, this was going to come out. We're told that divorce is not an option, it is not in the frame. What if two years down the road the princess, for instance, falls in love with another man or Prince Charles wants to marry another woman? It would be, it would be possible. Absolutely. They say this each time there's a, a royal separation and they talk about that the, a divorce is not on the cards. In actual fact, if Diana's a young girl, um, if she falls in love again and wishes to remarry, I see no let or hindrance why she should not divorce. And remember, Diana has always said to her friends that throughout her royal career, I will never become queen. The controversy over the state of the royal marriage took a new turn today when an article claiming to give Prince Charles's side of the story appeared in the Today newspaper. Written by the royal biographer Penny Juna, who knows the prince personally, the article says he feels betrayed by his wife's behaviour. The, 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 as soon as the book began to be serialised, I wrote a piece for Today newspaper. I then reviewed the book for Today newspaper and I'm, in both of these I spoke quite strongly in defence of the Prince of Wales because I felt just looking at it that he had been very badly maligned and unfairly so. I also spoke on radio and television. After one of the radio broadcasts I was telephoned by one of his friends who said I've just listened to you, that was terrific, thank you, please keep it up, please get the message across. You must remember that the princess lived within the British royal family for 15 years. She knew exactly what went on within it. She knew how things were done. She was at times extraordinarily unhappy and her husband did nothing. She felt very wretched much of the time, but at the same time she was a mother and she had to maintain a brave face for her children. She didn't want them too affected by her evident distress at finding herself in a loveless marriage with a husband who was carrying on an affair and not even bothering to hide it from her. The only secret Diana ever kept from me was the Martin Bashir interview for Panorama. I was sent home on a Sunday afternoon. Strange, I thought. Why would she be sending me home? Go and spend some time with your family. I'm doing nothing this afternoon. Don't worry about me. The next morning I came to work, I noticed all the furniture had been moved. Why have you moved the furniture? It's not in the same place. Um, I had a dance class. I had to move the furniture out of the way just so that we could exercise. Strange, very strange. She avoided me for the next two days, never spoke to me. And then she told me that she made a recording with Martin Bashir for Panorama. What have you said? Well. I just put the record straight, she said. I think every strong woman in history has had to walk down a similar path, and I think it's the strength that causes the confusion and the fear. Why is she strong? Where does she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? Something like 31 million people stopped in their tracks on that Monday night and couldn't believe what they were seeing. The Princess of Wales bearing her heart on national television. We couldn't take our eyes away from it. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. Do you think Mrs Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. I'll put one on top of that chance. Right. Right. Wait, no, for you? Yeah. yeah. The guy's the guy's got a big guy that's news kiosk. This guy is so notorious. Hey, Simon Byrne, <laughs> what do you think of John Major? <laughs> Well, actually, yeah. he's my best friend. Oh. Yeah. Do you think Di, Di was worth it? Yeah. Is Di worth 17 million? You can still comment, can't you? I mean, would you pay your wife 17 million if you got divorced? Oh, well, I'd probably, if I had it, I would, yeah. <laughs> I'm very surprised at that. I thought it was a very peculiar way of doing it. On the face of it, it was rather discourteous to the Queen. But Princess Diana is very good at manipulating the media, and it may well be that she did it like this to show that she could do her own thing, and also to give her a stronger bargaining power over the title that she wanted to have, and perhaps over the nature of the divorce settlement when it comes. 
Behind closed gates at Kensington Palace, the princess was said to be deeply upset at making and declaring the decision to end the marriage. It could happen swiftly, meaning a leap year divorce. So as the public read the papers, the royal lawyers set about reading the small print. What has yet to be worked out are the complicated details of a divorce. She's got the house, Kensington Palace, which Prince Charles has always wanted to get back because he's stuck, poor fellow, in St James's Palace. And she has got the children, and obviously there's nothing going to change. She's got the money from Charles to keep up her lifestyle. I think Diana wanted to get married again, and she wanted to have another child. Um, again, I think getting married again probably was a bit of a fantasy, certainly getting married to uh, the doctor that she was in love with or thought she was in love with was a fantasy because it would never have worked out, it couldn't have worked for him. Um, but she did want to get married again, very much so. She didn't want to be single for the rest of her life. She does, and in a way, I think she wanted to find someone that could work with her in a way that it was what she'd hoped for when she married Prince Charles, is that, well, a little later in their marriage, when, you know, when things were going well and they were doing things together, she sort of thought, she said to him, you know, we could really, we could really change things together, the, the power of the two of us together. And that's what she wanted. So she want, she did, I think she wanted to marry someone who, was, who had the same humanitarian outlook as her. Not in a Harry and Meghan kind of way, but in a very simple way. She wasn't going to talk in riddles, and she wasn't going to give a lot of speeches about what she was going to do. She was going to get out in the field and do it. On the day of their divorce, they sat down on the sofa together and cried. But I think that might have been Diana's fantasy, because I couldn't work out that they would have even been together at that moment. But at some stage, they obviously felt very sad about it, and, and they talked to each other. And, and Charles was much friendlier with Diana. Now he knew that the nightmare, that she'd actually become unshackled from him. That he was able to form a, a, a much more reasonable relationship with her. <laughs>